Using a mist of synthetic sweat, the corrosion test exposes strings to elements mimicking a human finger. Over time, excess remains strong, while other strings corrode and become damaged. Testing complete. Hey, this is John Bollinger with Premier Guitar. We are at the CMA Theater, which is in the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm with Doug MacArthur, who is Steve Vice Tech. Hey, That's Doug. Fine. Nice to meet you, John. Yeah, pleasure to meet you. Yeah. I Okay, <laughs> I gotta hear about this. You get, with yeah. all the tech gigs, this has gotta be a tough gig. Yeah, the Hydra is, um, you know, as an instrument, it's, it's really stable. It doesn't really give me many issues, but, I mean, there's so much surrounding it the whole tour kind of rides on it because this is a big part of the show when right. it comes out. Right, I mean, so is there a big reveal? You know, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a big, you know, black scrim. That, it's a <laughs> whole cool thing. I've seen it online. Yeah. But, yeah, okay, so take me through the whole enchilada, what yeah. we have going on here. Well, um, you know, Steve's told the backstory about it, you know, many times online, you know, what, how he thought it up, how Ivan has created it. But uh, I think it might be interesting for me to just kind of take you through it technically. Sure, you know? yeah, please. And, uh, you know, simply, it's four instruments in one. A 12-string, a 7-string, a bass that's half fretless, and a harp. Wow. And, um, well, and even this 12-string, the frets stop. Yeah, it's, of course, it's got to be quirky. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, this is all quirk. It's a, yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, how do you do it? How well, do you, <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> Steve, Get back there, Doug. How do you, so, how do, you um, do this thing? Well, so the, the, uh, the signal all gets funneled into an Ethernet cable. So there's not, you know, like four independent quarter-inch outs. It's a really streamlined kind of signal flow. Um, you know, f first I should say, you know, each instrument has its own, you know, on-off, its volume control, pickup selector. Um, and the harp just has a piezo strip underneath the, uh, the fret here. It's really a fret. And uh, it comes out through an ethernet cable and it goes into a brain. So each instrument then has its own, you know, independent volume control, wow. which is on 10 all the time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, of course. And uh, Ibanez, you know, they've made a few different versions of the brain. You know, the first one was this enormous gold one that was in the music video. And it's so cool, we took it on tour and then they made a smaller one that wasn't quite, you know, right. And then they made me these little tiny, like half rack space ones that are just a dream, you know, cause I get a backup one. And cause where are you gonna find a backup Hydra brain in yeah. Nashville? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or anywhere. Or anywhere, yeah. yeah. So um, after it leaves the brain, the seven string goes through his normal rig. You know, it's still his, you know, coming out of the 412s through the synergies. But the uh, 12 string, the bass, and the harp go into the fractal, and they're modeled. They use modeling, you know, and that goes to front of house. Huh. So that way we don't have to drag, you know, four other right. amps on tour. And there's no using pedals when he's using this. No, guitar. and I'll tell you a funny story because everything's programmed for that song. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of MIDI changes, there's pedals being turned on and off in the rack. And we were playing a show in, I think, Istanbul. Somewhere in Turkey, maybe. Cool. And the playback rig went down, which controls all of the changes, you know? I'm like, I'll, I'll build the rig, it's bulletproof, but if the playback rig goes down, I, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I realized, I'm like, I'm gonna have to crouch down at the pedal board and do all the changes. It's like 50 changes. <laughs> oh, God. So Steve, you know, he's trying to figure it out and he comes off stage and I go, I'm good. the only way you're gonna be able to play it is if I go out there and do it. And he goes, do you have them memorized? I go, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But I did, and we, we nailed it. And we actually kept having to do it on that tour because uh, there were just gremlins in that playback rig. Yeah. And, but yeah, when everything goes right, which is now 100% of the time. Yeah. 
European power can be a little dodgy, that old. I always have, yeah. It's yeah. nowhere else in the world but Europe I have problems. No offense, Europe. Yeah, yo, no, I love you're you. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love you, Europe. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, during the song, he can't, because he's not wearing it. Right. You know, he can't walk up to the pedal board and, and who could? Yeah. You know, I mean, can you imagine? Well, and, this thing weighs almost 30 pounds. And God, when you've got that much going on, who could think yeah, about pedals? Exactly. So, um, one of the things I did was I built this stand for it, which um, it's really great because it's easy to take the guitar in oh. and out of. You know, when I bring it on stage during the show, it's very easy to slip it in. You know, you don't have to kind of dick around in the dark. Yeah. And um, this has been really great because you can adjust it. I, I designed it really so you can adjust it totally 360 and up and yeah. down. And so did you like 3D print that or something? No, or? I, I went to, uh, there was a place in Burbank called Film Tools huh. and I bought this really great stand. And then I had to make all of these kind of custom appointments like the, this piece of, this is like a piece of military grade black plastic that I cut to the shape so that you can see through the harp. Because oh, yeah. we did have a stand that someone built, and it was it was kind of like a sheet music stand that it rested in, and you couldn't you couldn't see through the harp, you know. Yeah. You want to see more Vi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but then I built this call that um, you know it's kind of rubberized, and it's, <gasps> it uh, worked out really Chuck well. Chuck, that is really clever. Yeah, it was it was. Uh, and so came what? Out good. What is the harp tuned to? <laughs> I have the tuning written down, but I will confess that I've memorized it. Every day when I take it out of the case, I just, I just know. You just, yeah, just I have this little harp tuner. Huh. And, but like I was saying, I mean, this guitar is really stable. You know, some guitars, you, you go to a different state and depending on the climate, the neck is now like a oh. banana. And the Hydra, I've had to make precious little adjustments to it you well, know, in the year and a half that I've been, you know, touring with it. Well, it's a really stable guitar. Never, ever once have I had a problem with any of the electronics. Ibanez did a really great job. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, I remember, you know, Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick had that like seven neck guitar. Yeah. And I remember, and I remember reading an interview with his tech years ago. He said, God, that thing. I, <laughs> it is a nightmare, <laughs> you know, because it's so much to keep. Oh, yeah, you know. I bet. Uh, I'm sure you didn't, I, probably didn't have to worry about tuning the last three necks. No, yeah, yeah. I think they were <laughs> ornamental. <laughs> yeah. But he actually, he actually plays all this. I Does mean, he really? I mean, I mean, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, oh, oh, I'm, Steve. Well, Steve yeah. actually. Yeah, Steve. Plays I all. mean, he. I don't want to play it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, when you watch him, I mean, God. When before we start tours, he rehearses. You know, he he just wants the Hydra to be so perfect. You know, he's yeah. a perfectionist, and. It's so funny to go into the studio and walk in on him playing this thing because he's just so hyper focused. And um, yeah, I mean, it's the cool thing about that song is that it's a it's a great song. The Teeth yeah. of the Hydra, you know, the song got released before the music video got released. Oh. So you hear it, you go, oh, it's got a beautiful melody. But then you have no idea, having no idea. Yeah. You know? And that's really cool because I don't think a lot of guitar players could really do that. You know, they'd get this in their hands and it would turn into a tech fest yeah and steve was able to craft this beautiful mellifluous body motion and melody out of it oh, that's and great. and he'll probably write more songs with it you know so it's got the whammy but do you it's totally blocked off okay blocked. yeah 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 although you know what's cool is i've been has made a bunch of custom steampunk whammy bars for it <laughs> and they're so cool you know, some are like really exaggerated and long yeah. other ones are are uh, kind of artsy Right. Well, God, that's what I've always kind of liked about his gear. Like, DeMarzio's new pickups. Yeah. The, they have yeah. that really just cool aesthetic. You yeah, know? And, and I should give a shout out because Larry DeMarzio. He, he's amazing. He's the nicest guy on the planet. Larry and Eric, Eric Corpus at DeMarzio, they just, they're the sweetest people. Yeah. They give Steve whatever he wants and they're always willing to, you know, adjust and tweak things. They make all sorts of great custom cables for me. I mean, Steve's stage cable is, you know, 60 feet long. And I call him up, I go, can we get three more 60 foot neon green cables? And they're there tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and all the cables that I use in the loom, when I, usually at the beginning of every tour, I rebuild the cable loom because it gets beat up, you know? Sure. And it's all DeMarzio, speaker cables, pickup straps. Right. Larry DeMarzio is just, uh, it's all fine. Yeah, I think that he is much like Steve. He's one of these guys that is just, 
driven by an intellectual curiosity and a creativity yeah. and he doesn't compromise. And he doesn't, and on top of it, he's one of the greatest rock photographers on the planet. Oh God, yeah. amazing, yeah, yeah, amazing. He's a just- You could pay me later, Larry. Yeah, yeah, Larry, <laughs> hey Larry, big fans here. <laughs> I need those cables. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Okay, well this is a very cool start. But I'll show you before we cut with this thing. Yeah, yeah. I want you to hit that switch. This one, that, mm -hmm. that. <laughs> There's all sorts of little Easter eggs on this thing. Yeah, man, that like, <laughs> I thought you triggered the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when the playback rig goes down. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Okay, that is that is a, you don't want to accidentally hit that. You the, don't, I remember the first tour we took this on when Dante, Steve's rhythm guitar player, yeah. who's the greatest guy, again, on the planet. He was uh, Dave Wiener's tech, Steve's old rhythm guitar player. And we use, I mean, it takes two people to bring this out on stage. One oh, guy comes with the stand and plants it. Sure. And I come out with the guitar. And I remember at the end of one of the songs, Dante accidentally hit it. <laughs> and it was just so spinal tap. You know? <laughs> yeah. It was just, yeah. it was great. Because that thing, it takes a while to settle down. You know? Oh, yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> and it is shockingly loud. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I well, wish you people in YouTube land could hear this, because it, it was... Yeah. Don't worry, Flaming. you didn't just tune into the Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's very cool. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get into some more relatable guitars. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, let's, um, let's go take a look at the guitars. Yeah, okay, so everybody has seen this guitar. Yeah. Tell, okay, tell me about the, the name. I always assumed it's evil, <laughs> kind of like a, like, a, like a Miles Smiles, Miles Evil kind of thing. I, I, Not quite. Yeah. But you're close. Well, okay. he's not close. <laughs> no, uh, when Steve, um, you know, the gem came out in 1986. Yeah, isn't that and shocking? I know. It's, it's one of the longest running signature series guitars in history. You right. Know? Yeah, because there weren't, I mean, the rock signature guitar is not that, I mean, it started around that time. Around, yeah, when Fender, you know, there was, I think, a Clapton Strat, a Yngwie, you know. Yeah. But this is just so unique. Oh, yeah. Know? But basically, I think it was around 1992 when you know, they kind of wanted to tone down the neon fluorescent colored gems. Although, I love that. Oh, who doesn't, yeah. you know? Well, and, and, and I'm told that that kind of crazy first one was from a design from like curtains in his home or something like that? Yeah, actually there was a floral pattern gem. Yeah. And the, the curtains that were in Steve and Pia's house were the fabric that was used. Yeah. Um, That's... That's to me is the one. Yeah, but this is the one we all see. Sorry, it's the one side you all see. note. Yeah, Let's I'll, get into it. It's going to be a lot of side notes. Let's get back into Evo. So, Evo, <laughs> well, so Evo, I think he received four prototypes, four yeah. white gems with gold hardware and the vine inlays. And at the time, he was working with Larry on um, developing a set of signature pickups. And so I think he named the pickups after Harley Davidson engines. So there was like the pan head, the knuckle head, the evolution. Really? And so he wrote Evo, just so he could tell the guitars apart. And he liked the evolutions the most. And I'll say the evolution is still his favorite pickup. You know, it's, it's just a great DiMarzio pickup and yeah. I have it in most of the guitars. Um, so Evo became the main guitar. You know, it first started getting used on Sex and Religion, which was yeah. the album that he made in 93. And it's, it's just been a mainstay throughout his whole career. Yeah. And it's had, you know, accidents. I think there was a point at some point around the time I was born <laughs> when he threw the guitar and he was stepping on the cable and it slammed down and it got this enormous crack that widened after a time, but it's been expertly repaired. I think, I think it was sent to Hoshino oh, and really? they injected a, a really stellar type of uh, epoxy because this is one of the most stable guitars that Steve owns. You know, people will ask, you know, when people come up to do the meet and greets, yeah. you know, everyone wants to see Evo, of course. Yeah. And a lot of people will ask, you know, is, is he gonna retire it? You know, is it unstable, does it stay in tune? And yeah, yeah it's, it's bulletproof. Um, and the guitar has such a rich, rich history, you know, Les Paul signed it. Um, How cool. You know, and this is, I think, Evo's sixth or seventh neck. 
this neck that's oh, on here. Really? So the neck, so I was, I was assuming it's been refretted a few times. Yeah, but. this neck that's on here now was, um, is actually from Steve's Evo Relic, which came oh. out in 2012. They did like a limited edition uh, run of like a relic gem, that, yeah. you know, and they had, it, it was basically identical to Evo. But yeah, I, this neck is from that one. And I refretted this maybe about a half a year ago with the, the fret wire Steve likes, which is EVO gold, like a standard jumbo sized, you know. And, um, you know, it's got the low pro Cosmo black tremolo. Um, I guess a couple of the interesting details is it has a push pull 500K audio taper DiMarzio pot that when you pull it up, it engages a high pass filter. Oh. So like when he starts tender surrender, and it's, you know, it's a very distorted sound, but he rolls the volume back and clicks that in and it's very, uh, very clean and crystally. You know, it's a great sound. Really? Yeah, it just huh. filters out the bottom end. Yeah. <clears throat> but the neck pickup in Evo is actually an evolution bridge model flipped upside down. And the reason for that is because when you use the fourth position, uh, the coil that stays on when the humbucker is split is the one that's closest to the end of the fretboard. So oh. it's a bit more of a truer, strattier kind of sound. Sure. Um, but aside from that stuff, you know, the tone control is disengaged. That's not wired up. Um, oh, really? No, no tone control. No tone. <laughs> but that's kind of it. It's, it's, you know, pretty close to, you know, a stock gem. Just a lot more beat up. <laughs> Great. God, you know, I'm really surprised that he replaces the necks. Yeah, I mean, he, things warp. I don't really know the full history because... Yeah. I've been with Steve for a year and a half now. You know, yeah. I was always a big fan, so I, I knew a lot about the guitars, but you know, after seven necks, how do you keep track of that? You know? Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a very cool start. Yeah. Let's see, it's, uh, it's twin sister. It's twin sister. <laughs> yeah, Flow 3 is the other main guitar. And this is, I'll just say it, it's Steve's favorite guitar. You know, this is a really resonant, just awesome guitar. And the main difference, of course, is the Fernandez sustainer that's mounted in this one, which is something he uses all the time. And um, I'm trying to think what else might be unique about Flow that I haven't said in other interviews. Um, it's got a lot of wear in the body because the, the finish on Evo is significantly thicker. Oh, really? Yeah. And Flow 3 is actually a, um, it's a gem that they made for him at the LA Custom Shop at Ibanez. Oh. So um, they kind of assembled it out of, you know, what parts they had there. So it's a little, little different than, you know, a traditional production guitar. Yeah. But yeah, you know, gold low pro trem, that's Steve's favorite tremolo system. You know, when I first started working for Steve, Evo had a um, original edge, which is kind of, you know, what the original gems had. You know, it's more of a Floyd style. And the low pro, it's just kind of a different body, you know, and the saddles kind of lock in a little differently. But I, I discovered that there's a difference in the tone. You know, the original edge has more of that classic mid-rangey Floyd thing. And the low pro, it's more of a scooped sound. It's got a little more bottom. Huh. And so that's why Evo has a low pro, if anyone's wondering, because that got changed at one point. Oh. Um, it's amazing how you know, everything affects it, you know? Everything. It's a whole system, the guitar. And, you know, it's all absorption and reflection. And yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. But, yeah, Evo, um, sorry, not Evo. Flow 3 is lightly scalloped. Um, again, it's got the EVO gold fret wire. And um, that's kind of it, you know? Okay. There's nothing super special about his guitars. It's just that he lovingly plays them so much they just get so worn in and he gets so attached to them well and i mean from the beginning he really did design something just totally unique you yeah know? which is cool because so many signatures like we were saying at the time signatures are like clapping out a strat yeah and it's like basically well yeah you know, it's like god bless him but it's you know maybe different pickups and a signature on the headstock yeah. you know of course yeah. there's more to it than that yeah that's why i'm not going to read the comments below <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah don't yeah but don't <laughs> Don't read the comments. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, Evo and Flo have pretty thin necks, maybe even a little thinner than like production models because he just likes really thin necks. Yeah, the few times I've picked up a gym, the neck really throws me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wide and thin. Wide and thin. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's Flo. Okay, cool. Well, let's look, at a, let's look at a couple more. Let's do it. Okay, a little more conventional yeah. on this one. Yeah, this is a great guitar because 
it's kind of the closest you're going to get to a gem and a strat you right know, having a uh, a baby <laughs> yeah and steve's got two of these one's shaped more like a strat and this is the kind of gem one and ivan has built these for him i think in the early 2000s and when he wrote candle power and wanted to make the music video for it this was the guitar that he plays in the performance video and um it's got, you know, it's got Fender Fat 50s pickups in it because those were the pickups that were in the guitar Steve used to record it because it's just such a stratty vibe that he sure. wanted. Just strat, strat, fourth position, that's it. Yeah. Um, and the neck, the cool thing is that, you know, sometimes when you put single coil pickups in a guitar with 24 frets, the whole ensemble of the position of the pickups gets moved back and they don't really sound, it doesn't sound like a strat. Yeah. And the great thing about this guitar is it's a very standard 21 fret pickups in the right kind of strat location. And because of that, it just, it sounds like a great strat. It's right. a really awesome sounding guitar that's very authentic. Um, and little spec things with this guitar. Um, I, when I refretted it with the fret wire that he likes, I re-radiused the fretboard to be a little flatter because I think it had it had like a seven and a quarter inch radius, I think. And I think I flattened it to 12. I didn't quite go to 16, which is wow. like what the gems are. But it's- So you um, pulled the frets, did the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And it's great because the longer we tour with this guitar, the fretboard just gets all grimy. <laughs> and uh, he loves playing it. It's, it's a really cool one. Okay, is the tone control hooked up on this one? It's hooked up on this one, okay. yeah. <laughs> I should mention these, these, this is cool. So Steve's previous tech that everyone's familiar with, Thomas. We all love Thomas. Um, he designed this cool thing a while back, which is paper binding clips. But you kind of bend them and contort them and put Velcro on them, and they become really great pick holders. Um, oh, let's go on Amazon and buy, I think they're called C-Line paper binding clips. And I, I buy them, because you have to replace them. They get kind yeah. of worn out. But really, this is great because Steve, you know, you get hot and sweaty on stage and you drop guitar picks and they're just there. So that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I never knew. Oh, speaking of things like that, yeah. what kind of picks do, uh, is he using in, in strings? Uh, strings, it's always Ernie Ball. You know, each guitar, I, sh I should clarify, Evo and Flo, the guitars we just saw, those are 9 to 42. Just totally standard pink pack that you could buy at any guitar store. Sure. And um, this guitar is 9 to 46, uh, so the hybrid slinkies. Um, but the picks are, uh, there's two companies that make us picks. Dunlop makes us these really great, um, they're 1.14 millimeter, and they've got the uh, inviolate artwork on them. Yeah, cool. And um, he uses those 90% of the time. But when he plays the Hydra, he uses these really cool ones. I don't have any on me, but they're 1.5 millimeters thick. They're pretty, they're like poker chips. And those he likes because he's got to play the bass, you know? Right. So having a thinner pick, it's, you know, it would get so chewed up. Yeah. So that was the pick he was using for a long time. And then he wanted to lighten it up a little. So Dunlop makes us these really great picks. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that somebody like Vi, who is so well established and been doing this forever, He's still evolving, still changing yeah. things like Yeah, he loves to do that, yeah, because yeah. he's interested, you yeah. know. Thank God. Yeah, hey, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's very cool. That's this Let's one. Let's see this one. This is a classic. This, this guitar is called Bo, and... Very subtle. Yeah, very <laughs> subtle. <laughs> yeah. Um, the cool thing about Bo, one of the cool things, is it was, again, it was a prototype for the mirror top gems that came out in the mid-2000s. So you'll notice that the um, contour here has all this crazing because they were still kind of experimenting on how to wrap the, the acrylic around it. Sure. And I think, I think Steve received three or four of them. Three of them were immaculate and this one had this. And of course, in true Steve fashion, he goes, that's the one I like. <laughs> <laughs> and this guitar sounds massive. You know, it's, it's usually the guitar that we leave set up in drop C. So he plays Bad Horsey on it. He plays Avalancha, which is one of the songs from the new record. Um, and it's, it's, you know, again, pretty similar to, to Flow in the respect that it's got, you know, a Fernandez sustainer, Evolution bridge pickup, 
Um, this one does have the high pass filter, but it's just hardwired to the uh, cap. I mean the pot, it, there's no push pull. And yeah, of course the LEDs. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And yeah. uh, yeah, so Sander, what's, what's this other guy do? Oh, this? Yeah. So these switches, um, you'll see them on flow. Is one you the know, sustainer? One turns the sustainer on and off. So up is on. And then there's a three way kind of toggle. So up is like the full fundamental mode. The middle one is kind of halfway between fundamental and harmonic. And then the down position is the crazy harmonic feedback. So that's what that, that's how this, you know, sustainer comes on and off and is controlled. And there's a gain pot for the sustainer too on, on all the guitars, huh. but I stick these rubber O-rings under them so they can't move because they're just always on 10. Yeah. Yeah. Maximum vibration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this one, when I refretted this guitar, I didn't put the EVO wire on it because, um, I don't remember why. I think he wanted to stick with just regular nickel silver, but they're, they're big, beefy kind of jumbo frets because you can't really scale up this guitar with the LEDs, you know? Right. So uh, it's got big, big fat fret wire and Velcro for the slide because when he plays Bad Horsey, right. you know, some of it's with the slide, some isn't, so kind of tucks it on there. Yeah. And that works great. That's another Thomas Nordig thing. <laughs> Yeah. Same with these cool uh, magnets. This was something Thomas came up with many years ago. And it's this really high powered flexible magnet sheet that you can get from, I think the company is McMaster Car. And you just buy it and chop it up and you can stick it on the back of the headstocks. And it's great because you know, you've got a guitar that has a Floyd and yeah, you're gonna need you those always Allen lose those Allen wrenches. Yeah. So they're there and it's so convenient. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's Bo. Bo gets set up a little different too, because it's 10 to 52 because you know, the drop C. Sure. And when he starts the show, uh, he plays this song Avalancha and he likes a lower normal kind of action. And then as soon as I get the guitar back from him, uh, I crank the action way up and get it ready for bad horsey because with the slide, it's, it's So you're be a adjusting the action in between songs. I adjust the action in between songs. I change the presets in the rig. I, <laughs> I got this whole workout routine with the guitar cable. Yeah. Part of the reason is cable's 60 feet long yeah. is because I have it running all the way back to me so I can pull it because I don't want him to trip. Sure. Know? He's got to stay safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one can get hurt playing rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, there's a lot going on in the show. That's the funniest moment, really, because second song, I'm like... <laughs> adjusting the guitar, dipping down, cable, change oh. the, it's, it's hilarious. It's, yeah. it's a total workout. Yeah, that, yeah, because sometimes you see, you see, <laughs> you see texts that are like, stare at their phone during <laughs> yeah. the show. There's no, and, there's no phone or shoegaze in yeah. the live show. Yeah, no, yeah you're, good for you, that's great. Yeah, it just keeps it interesting. Yeah, you know, oh yeah. It really does. Okay, well that's very cool. Do you have, uh, I got some more is there one? Yeah, let's yeah. see, uh, let's see something else. Okay, so what do we got here? Looks like a lot of strings. A lot of strings. This is a seven string. Um, you know, when I first started working for Steve, I thought it would be so cool to get him to use the mirror ball guitar that he used in Whitesnake again. Right. He was hanging in the studio and I'm like, that is so cool, you know? Yeah. And I, I did a lot of work to that guitar to, to have it, you know, come out on tour with us again. And he played it on Zeus and Chains, which is the song that he uses a seven string for in the set. And we took it you know, around Europe and the US, it was great. And then before we left for this tour, I thought, let's change it up, you know, bring some different guitars. And I went in the basement and I found this. And this is a prototype for the 90th anniversary gems that came out, which had this really cool textured finish. Um, and well, when you said the 90th? 90, well, 90th <laughs> of Machino. Because I'm pretty sure uh, in real math, it's like, 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, they, uh, for whatever reason, they called the 90th anniversary. Yeah, you know? it's like Maybe someone messed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I rock just. Rock and roll years. In rock and roll years, yeah. yeah. It's We're all 90. Yeah. Um, but I opened the case and I thought, that just looks like the song Zeus and Shane. Yeah, you know, because cool. there's a. On the, on the screen that plays during the show, there's music videos for certain songs, and Zeus and Shane's has a very kind of Roman, kind of dark you know, uh, there's all sorts of statues and stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought this looks like a weathered statue. It looks like Zeus, we're taking it. Sure. So, you know, I put all the little mods in, the high pass filter. 
Uh, I think I put some some of these pickups in that Larry made. They're I think they're Blaze pickups. But they've got chrome tops because the pickups that were in this guitar were black. They were just old black Blaze pickups, and I'm like, it's got to be chrome. It's all got to be chrome. Sure. <laughs> And uh, I actually had to put some inlays in because the only inlays were these little uh, dots at the 12th fret. Oh, really? Yeah, so that way he can just see, you know, when he's zipping around on stage where he's going. Yeah. But this is another just great, stable, workhorse guitar. Sounds huge. Um, just a, a very unique one. And they only made one because the other ones were all six strings. This was the only seven that they made. And a fan made this really cool plate. Um, yeah, I've seen these plates on each, so these are yeah. all fan made? Yeah, I think this, there's a guy in Indonesia named Ivan, and he made a couple for Steve years ago, and there's one on Evo, there's one on Flow, but then I think other people have since started making them and just using different graphics, and someone made the Passion and Warfare album cover into one. Too cool. And I thought that's gotta go on the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this is Zeus. And uh, it just gets used for that one song. <clears throat> Very cool. Yeah. Love it. Okay. And this guitar. Oh, yeah. This is... this is the one everyone always wants to see when we do the stage tours because it's so unvi. You know, the fact that yeah. it's a 335. Of course, it looks vi. But, yeah. But this is a cool guitar for many reasons. Um, when Steve recorded Little Pretty, which is the song he plays this on, he used a Gretsch to record it and it's got a big, fat, jangly sound, and he wanted to, you know, use a hollow body live so that it would be in that same kind of sonic territory. And we went through so many hollow bodies in rehearsals, you know, fully hollow ones, ones with center blocks, and finally, Mike Arrigo at Ibanez, who, Mike, I just gotta give a shout out, is the most helpful guy on the planet. You know, he, he's the head of artist relations at Ibanez, and he just, he rocks. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, he brought this over. Is and it a Schofield? It's a Schofield. He brought a tobacco sunburst one, and we took that to Europe. Yeah. And that was the guitar he used on Little Pretty. And then they gave one to this really uh, interesting artist, this guy, David Bonvillain, who... Um, like a visual artist. Yeah. yeah. And he, well, he dipped it. He's a oh, fantastic cool. um, swirl artist. And matter of fact, he just, uh, we just had a really successful launch of the Bon Valain Pias. There's a, oh, cool. a new uh, Pia coming out that's all dipped, totally crazy. And he did this one in purple and gold and black. I love it. And uh, all this pinstriping and it's, it's a beautiful guitar. He did such a great job. <laughs> so good. Well, it's funny with that paint it's really it doesn't look like a Schofield at all no I mean, it's like no. It, it's, it's like, like it changes John the body. acid <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> right um but aside from the crazy paint it's pretty stock you know I, I've disconnected the tone controls so it's just you know volume for the bridge volume for the neck three way and you foamed it yeah I put foam in it just, I put foam in every facet of that cavity that would accept it so they just shoved it in <laughs> there yeah and... yeah because um Sometimes Steve plays louder at different venues, depending sure. on what the stage volume can handle. Yeah. And sometimes it's just, it's, this guitar starts howling. Sure. So, um, yeah, the foam is taking care of all of that. Yeah. But um, I should say that I did refret this mainly so that I could re-radius the board on this one too. This is actually, I've planed it to 16, just like a gem. Oh, really? So it's, it just feels like a gem to him when he picks it wow. up. Wow. Because that's a oh, little pretty is a hard song to play. I mean, there's a lot of bizarre, you know, techniques in that one. You know, I don't think he plays any easy songs. No, that's, that's right. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, again, you know, this is just another really unique, cool guitar, and people love seeing it. You know, yeah. it's just especially under stage lights. Oh my God, it's a, uh, it's a looker. <laughs> yeah, cool. And I love, I love all that on the back that nobody even gets to see. No one gets to see it. Yeah. It's like a little treat to himself. That's yeah, great. and of course it's got a great puffy guitar strap. Yeah. This Prince moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, this this guitar is set up with 10 to 46. So at one point I had heavier strings on it, you know. So it's all all different. Each yeah. guitar is kind of its own little, you know, lives in its own zip code. He likes sure. things set up just, you know, a little differently for every other guitar. Yeah, it makes sense. Otherwise, why would you change? You yeah. Know, unless, yeah. Unless it's going to bring something different out of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well that is very cool. Okay, great guitars. 
Let's talk about this over here, shall yeah. we? All right, Doug, here we are in, uh, well, in this rack land. Tell me all about it. Well, um, this is kind of an interesting rig, you know, when we get to the rack, because when um, we had to go to Europe on the last leg, I had to fly with all the gear, you know, and all of Steve's rig was mounted in this enormous <laughs> Uh, shock mounted rack that weighed 200 pounds. There was no way it was going to go on an airplane. You yeah. Know? So I, um, I decided to um, split the rig up in three sections with these really great um, SKB racks. They're basically oh, yeah. frames sure. of a rack that then go into these kind of shock mounted Pelican style cases. So, you know, they get packed up at night and they're super safe, whether I take them on a plane or on the bus. And uh, the first rack, which is this six space one, is kind of the main chunk of the rig. You know, the guitar, I should probably say the signal, you know, he goes into a Wawa Dunlop 95Q, and then it goes into this Gemini, which is his signature Ibanez distortion pedal. And then that goes into a Whammy, the Whammy DT, and then it goes into the Synergy. And this is such a great system because it's very low noise, it's very practical. I've never had a single problem with anything, you know? Nothing's ever really gone wrong with the synergies, uh, which is worth a lot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's got four modules on here, two Vi modules. This, is, this top left one is the main one that he kind of lives in. And it's got, you know, kind of his legacy sound, you know? Sure. But I believe him and Dave Friedman tweaked it a bit, you know, when they designed this one. And he's got a second one that's kind of more or less tuned for different guitars. You know, it's a little lower gain. And then he's got two of the uh, bassmen or B-man style ones. So these utilize really great kind of 70s sounding, you know, broken up, uh, you know, crunchy, crunchy tube amp sounds. And sure. really fantastic sparkly clean sounds. And this comes out into the axe effects. Um, which is only used for delays, reverbs, choruses. Um, you know, the only time the Axe FX is used for modeling in this rig is with the Hydra, you know, the bass and the 12 string and the harp. Um, but, you know, the, his normal guitar tone, you know, it's, there's no modeling. So once it comes out of the Axe FX, it comes out in stereo, and that goes into these really great uh, Fryette LX2s which are these single space, um, you know, tube power amps that just kick ass. Uh, we've, we've used a few different ones. Synergy makes some really good ones. Uh, Fryette makes some larger ones that are, are also great. But the reason we're using these is because, um, two reasons. One, it's got this great feature where even when you're using it in stereo, it's just one volume control. So, you all, of course, you always want left and right to be, you know, very level, you yeah. know, very equal. And that's what you accomplish with this, you know, nothing right. gets bumped accidentally and sure. But also, um, they're, they're pretty light, you know, they're still, you know, big dog tube amps, but, um, I can take two of them in a small, you know, two space rack and it doesn't weigh too much to take it on a plane and there's no tonal compromise. You know, they're really, they're on par with anything that's great out there. Um, and this section of the rack, it's all just kind of Hydra stuff. You know, these are the brains that I had talked about earlier. Um, and there's a power conditioner. But there's this Roland drum module, which has some sounds loaded in it that the little MIDI triggers on the Hydra hit. Oh, okay. So there's a couple goofy ones that are in there. And there's some other stuff tucked away too, like DIs. Just, it's all Hydra stuff. Um, but once it leaves the uh, power amps, it goes into these Carvin uh, 412 cabinets, which are on each side of the stage. And they have vintage 30s. That's Steve's favorite speaker. Yeah. Um, and we use uh, 57s to mic them up on stage. You know, it's interesting, because when I saw the fractal, I was a little disappointed, because he's always been such an amp guy. But yeah. ultimately, yeah, this, it is tube amps, it's, and it's, it's tube. This probably is a, on, I mean, you're hearing tube amps, through those cabs. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it looks deceiving because you look at this yeah. rig and you think, oh, modeling. But yeah. no, it's all, all, you know, all tube. Tube preamps, tube power amps. Yeah. It's just because everything's so now. <laughs> at first, the, yeah. At first, I was a little bothered, but now, now, I'm, now I'm cool with it. No. Yeah, lo, yeah, tube amps. Uh, no, the day, the day he switches to just using modeling, 
you'll open your window and you'll see pigs flying. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Right, when it's all in ears, no, yeah. uh, no cabinets. Uh, speaking yeah. of in ears, you know, he uses, uh, he uses ears on stage, you know, night to night. But most nights, he uses just cotton in his ears. He just wants to hear the stage. I've got these cool little 112 uh, wedge-shaped guitar cabinets that right you can see. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And they've, they've got vintage 30s. That's why there's two power amps. You know, one's for the 412s and one's for the uh, wedges. And it's an awesome window to stand in. Oh, you know? I bet. Oh, you've got, you got 812s behind mm -hmm. you and two in front of you? Yeah, and all in stereo. So you get the, you know, the delays, the choruses. It's, oh. it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the pedal board up there. The pedal board is very well. simple. Yeah. Yeah, I am shocked at how just clean and easy it is. I'd like it to be clean. It is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the board, you know, the left side. I, I actually, I built this board so it splits in half. It goes in these two smaller cases. Good idea. Just, again, so when we fly, you know, you're not taking this thing that the airline's going to decline. Right, right. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, I, I know it's kind of out of frame, but I can just kind of mention, you know, yeah, the yeah. left side, um, you know, the wah wah, Gemini, uh, whammy DT. There's a little foot switch to turn the fan on and off. Right. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> we use that. these great chalks power supplies. They're called DC sevens. Sure. Super noiseless and I've great for never European had one fail. travel. As yeah, well. yeah. They convert automatically. Yeah. There's a little Lely, um uh, switcher, which is just for the Hydra. It just is the difference between his normal guitar going into the signal path and the Hydra. So I only have to hit that once during the show when I bring the Hydra out. And the other side, which um, is the right side, there's a Mastermind LT foot switch that controls all the different uh, preamps. So he's got his different, uh, different kind of amp channels that he can go to. Yeah. And right under that's an FC12. So that controls the fractal. And off stage, I have another FC12 that I use because some of the some of the songs are triggered with the playback rig. There's MIDI notes, you know, the stuff happens automatically. But there are certain songs where I kind of have to do it because you don't know, you know, night to night he might hit a note differently in right. a different spot of the song, or he wants to improvise and go longer. Okay, see, so that's what I'm curious about because it seems like the set is set, and yes. there's and yeah. and how much does he stretch? with that not much yeah because you know? he seems like like a like a real composer that he is wants to play what he's he's playing what he's playing for a reason he's not just like no you no know, he builds beautiful melodies and he's not going to bullshit around yeah. and you know improvise over them yeah so yeah. yeah i mean he the set list maybe one or two songs will change on a tour if he wants to change it up yeah you know there was one show in south america where we couldn't take the hydra and we did a song called valorum which is from his story of light album and that was cool, you know, just yeah. having a different song thrown in there. Yeah. But it stays very consistent. And yeah, I, like I said, some of the songs are programmed. Other ones, you know, I, I change the, the presets for them. And then there's just a volume pedal. It's just hooked up to the fractal. That's the secret weapon of the rig because, um, you know, Steve doesn't use noise gates. He doesn't like noise gates. He doesn't like what they do to the signal when right. you're playing. Even when you take a noise gate, even the best ones in the world, right. we've tried them. It's gonna. Yeah, I mean, he can't note. play tender surrender with a noise gate. Right, you know, right, because that nuance. Yeah, you just it totally lost. cuts you off. It's like yeah. trying to have a conversation with someone and they butt in before you make your point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the volume pedal is great because he finishes the song, or he, if he wants to talk during a rehearsal, just poop, no noise. Right. Yeah, could you imagine, like, back in Whitesnake, like, how loud <laughs> that had to have been, right? I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, man, it's, uh, I, this has been really interesting. I've been so curious about it. It's different than I imagined, but oh, cool. very cool. It's a, it's a great rig. Um, you know, it's, we have a beautiful stage every day, the big oriental rug. Yeah, love um, it. You know, I like things to be very neat and consistent. Seems you know? very civilized. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and we roll into certain venues and sometimes you get a very small stage. Sometimes yeah. you got a lot of space. Yeah. I, you know, I just like it to be very familiar for him when he walks on the stage every yeah. night. Yeah. Well, Doug, hey, man, thank you for uh, meeting us today. It's been a very pleasure. Welcome. It was really great. Yeah. All the best.